Welcome to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. This is my 124th show taped here on PAC TV, a show that we distribute throughout Plymouth County. And this show is about Plymouth County real estate. Our headline for the month was a good start to 2021 for Plymouth County, especially with refinances. We're going to talk about the recordings for the month of January. This show is being taped in February. And I'm going to start by going right to the numbers and looking at deeds. There were 708 deeds, which are sales of property, recorded in January, less than the 1,157 recorded in December, 5% more than the 672 deeds in January. Um, despite low inventory out there in real estate and multiple bids coming out on every property that is brought forward, um, real estate still remaining very positive, very hot. Um, the average sale price is, was up 7% from last month. You're going to see a listing of all the sales in Plymouth County for the month of January, all the way from Abington to Whitman, alphabetically. Every community had a lot of sales. Um, Plymouth and Brockton being the highest two in the county, which traditionally they are. Um, the, the big story of the last few months has been mortgages. While a lot of people still take out mortgages when they're purchasing property, a lot more people, because of the low interest rates, have been refinancing that property, and that adds to our total mortgage total. There were 3,390 mortgages recorded in January, down from the 3,517 in December, but up 82% over last January's 1,862. We know that will continue because the rates are so low. People are financing, in many cases, for the second time. We always talk about foreclosures. It's some, something that we've been following very closely since 2008. And I will say foreclosure deeds and notices are way down because of the moratoriums. There was a moratorium that was in place until October. The federal moratorium was just extended yesterday by President uh, Biden uh, to the end of, of the summer. So those numbers will continue to stay down. There are only six foreclosure deeds in January and six foreclosure deeds in December. However, foreclosure deeds are down 76% from last January. And the other foreclosure document we see is a foreclosure notice. It's the first document we see come into the registry when someone's in trouble. If you receive a foreclosure notice, we suggest to you don't wait. Reach out to a federal housing counselor. Um, there may be a way you can do a, a modification. Uh, there are companies like NeighborWorks um, of Southeastern Mass that help you do that. Um, there were 11 foreclosure notices in January. Uh, down from the 24 in December, 86%, however, less than last January. And I'm going to show you a list by, again, all 27 of our communities for the foreclosure deeds when a property is taken back by a lender in foreclosure notices, which are when um, you're in the step towards the foreclosure deeds. But you can see, because of the moratorium, there are a lot of zeros. Um, Marshfield, which is traditionally not our community that has the highest number of foreclosure deeds, had three foreclosure deeds, but those are still um, neg negligible, although very serious for those families. Um, I always mention we have a free property fraud alert. You can sign up for it, and then any notice that comes in under your name you get an email, um, something really good to think about. Uh, also will notify you when a discharge gets recorded. But clearly, if somebody is 
sneaking something in against you, you want to know as soon as possible. Uh, again, be aware if you find yourself with some foreclosure issues and reached out to a federal housing counselor. The federal housing um, um, relief has been extended um, but uh, to the end of the, of the summer, but please be vigilant. And we always have guests on this show. We've had many realtors, surveyors, appraisers, commercial uh, brokers, um, assessors, many different people involved in the real estate community. Last month, I had my ISA IT director at the Registry of Deeds, Christine Richards. And this month, I'm graced by the presence of Tim White, who's the Assistant Registry of Deeds. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we're getting through the COVID crisis and other projects that we're involved with. And quite frankly, all the work we've done over the years that have brought our records forward that have helped us prepare for a situation like the COVID crisis. So welcome, Tim. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, you've been on the show annually for a period of time. Yeah, I have. Yeah. So I feel comfortable here. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about how we, along with many other governmental and business operations, were hit by uh, the COVID-19 crisis and how we had to begin to navigate our way through that. Yeah, it was actually just about a year ago, right? Right. Uh, pretty incredible. And, and uh, it really was um, going into um, unknown territory. I mean, you hadn't had a pandemic since 1918, and none of us sure. were around back then. Right. Um, so there really wasn't a, a, uh, uh, a, a book that we could follow. Um, but like you said in the introductory remarks, the fact that we had been preparing for um, emergency situations and disasters and things of that nature um, did give us a, a sort of a head start um, in getting ready f and getting ourselves into a position where we could continue operations relatively uninterrupted. So the uh, best thing we have done as far as the recording of documents has been um, getting both sides of the registry, the recorded side and the registered land, land court side, um, able to be recipients of electronic recordings. And the timing could not have been better right. when it came to our land court. We obviously, we've been running uh, unrecorded land for, a recorded land for um, many years now uh, with electronic recording, but we, only got our land court up online um, for electronic recording probably within six months of the right. pandemic. Right, with some struggles. With a lot of struggles and, and, and some time. The struggles mm -hmm. you know, required time to get the kinks worked out, mm -hmm. but it could not have been any more fortuitous to have that because you know, with the, the pandemic, our electronic recording numbers have skyrocketed. I mean, they've more than doubled, probably. Yeah, so just uh, for the members of the public, we sometimes talk in shorthand. Um, recorded land, uh, it's very easy to see from your own deed and usually listed on your tax bill if you don't have it handy. It's a book and page document. If your deed is a book and page document, it is recorded land. If it has some kind of a certificate number on it, it identifies it as registered land. About 90% of our land records are recorded land, uh, the other 10% being registered land. Registered land was a system adopted in Massachusetts, not many other states, uh, that established like a ship's log entry uh, when a court's been involved. Uh, they they uh, put all uh, activity relative to, to a particular ownership on a certificate. Uh, you can actually look at your certificate and see uh, your mortgages, your discharges, and everything right on that certificate. Um, but it is much more complicated. It is probably the most complicated 
aspect of real estate for lawyers and everyone involved. Um, Fortunately for us, only 10% of our, yes, our property. Yes, we're very, very lucky yeah. with that. And those are properties that typically there had been some kind of dispute or question over the title. A boundary dispute, something. And, and which then ownership the, dispute. The land court got involved. Is, and, yeah. Straight, and they issued us a, a judgment that established the certificate. Right. Yep. So those are the two sides of the yeah. registry. Yeah. But and you're the, right. Getting that up and up and running just before this pandemic hit was absolutely crucial to the success we've had in dealing with the pandemic. Right. So we've been pretty consistent at about 80% of our recorded land has come in over the internet. It still has to be a wet ink, uh, real uh, document signed by the parties, notarized by the parties, and then, and then they have the ability to send that through the internet. So we're not receiving the live document, but it's authorized by by statute to do it that way. And the same thing with, with land court. Uh, there, there will be changes in the future about the way we do business, but this is clearly one that we were right on and very helpful. And just to put it into perspective, you just said that we're doing over 80% right. uh, of our recordings are now coming in electronically. Right. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were around 40%. Right, right. So. Obviously, the pandemic has uh, increased the number of, of submitters that we have, the lawyers, the sure. law firms, and the banks that right. submit their documents. Right. Um, and they themselves, the submitters, have now decided that it's a heck of a lot easier just to send it over, over, over the in internet as opposed to uh, doing the closings at the registry or driving them down or mailing them in. So when, when we really uh, had to get uh, serious about COVID issues and protecting our employees and also um, keeping people out of the building for title research that might might have spread, spread COVID was around the be beginning of March. So we're almost a full year out to this March. Yeah. We decided um, to have drop boxes. We have three offices in Plymouth County. We have our main office in Plymouth on Obery Street. We have a Brockton satellite office uh, here in Brockton over next to the Superior Court building on Belmont Street. And we have a satellite office over in Rockland over on Hingham Street. But for all three offices, we uh, weren't letting people into the building. We had drop boxes at each of the three offices. And that is what the remainder of the recordings were outside of, of e-recordings. And mail. And mail, yeah. right, and FedEx. You and know? FedEx, yeah. Right. And it's worked pretty smoothly. I mean, it's taken a little bit of adjusting. Uh, there's always folks that would like to come into the building to do their research, mm -hmm. but everybody understands the seriousness of the situation and respects our decision, like a lot of other businesses, to limit the folks that are in the building to the staff. and. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've taken a lot of steps to prepare for the ultimate return of the public, um, and hopefully that uh, that will become sooner rather than later, um, but we'll have protocols in place so that we can do it safely. And the, and the closing attorneys yeah. have been very creative in the way that they have um, dealt with the issue because by closing the buildings, None of our closing rooms were available for closing. We, we, we've looked out in the parking lot and seen more than one closing from car to car. In the parking lot. In the right? parking lot. Yeah, we have yeah. a great picture on our website of a fellow in Brockton that pulled a table out of his car and set, set it up right in the parking lot. Yeah. But, but mm -hmm. things get on record. There, we, there was nothing that didn't get on record that should have gotten on record during this time period. Well, not only that, John, but you, know, you look at the numbers that we've been right, recording right. in the, the year of the pandemic are higher than they were the year right. prior to the pandemic. Yeah, what, what Tim is mentioning is that um, <clears throat> the number of documents recorded in 2020, you know, the, basically the heart of the pandemic, were higher than any year um, back to 2006 for record number of recorded documents. So we certainly handled the surge. And, and the surge was from, um, obviously, a lot of sales. 
um, mostly a lot of refinances. And um, those documents really drove up uh, the demand, but there's still a lot of sales going on. Multiple bidders on properties, and it, we, despite a tight inventory, we're still uh, having more sales than we did last year. It won't be long before we enter the spring market, right. which traditionally is the best time to sell or buy a house. Right, right. So, so let's talk about, um, uh, obviously, we, we hope that as we get to the spring, where as things get back to normal, restaurants were just uh, increased in terms of percentage of seating. Um, we had a conversation with Donna Curtin the other day from one of our well-known museums in Plymouth, Pilgrim Hall Museum, and they're gonna start to have people come in in April. Uh, clearly, if things keep going in the right direction, people get vaccinated and the rates come down, uh, we will be looking at a more normal return to the registry and hopefully it's um, in the spring. It, things are looking like they're going in the right, right. direction right. And, and the only it's unpredictable but like, like I said earlier we'll be ready for it right. you know we'll be ready for it with with uh, social distancing protocols in place and limiting the numbers at least initially as to how many can come and go so we don't um, expose anybody to unnecessary risk but we're, we're, we're gonna get there so when I mentioned earlier that, that we were able to get our resources together to make this an easier transition um, over, over the years and working very hard uh, with outside companies as well as our staff we've been able to bring all of our land records the, the, the recorded land records back to 1685, actually 1686, um, when the county was formed out of Plymouth Colony, available over the internet, all indexed. We also did an indexing project, project yeah. that linked the index to those documents all the way back to the beginning, beginning of Plymouth uh, County. And our land court documents go back all the way to 1899, the beginning of land court in Massachusetts. So clearly those were very helpful. We also have had uh, most of our plans available. We continue to add things on a monthly basis. We just added our 1789 and 1903, was it 18, 1879 and 1903 uh, atlases which a lot of people use to, to cite properties, particularly you know when the boundaries were formed for those properties back in that time period. It's a helpful start for a lot of people doing title examinations, and we'll continue to add resources until they're all available online. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, some of our older records were in cursive. Yes. And we have um, been working on transcription projects to right. take us right back until the, the, the founding of the, of the colony, so, of the county. Right, so we've done a um, trans, um, transition, no, transcription. transcription project yeah. from 1685 up to around 1812, I believe. Yeah, that's about right. And then we're doing an editing project following that to make sure that uh, the transcriptions, the transcriptions are, are correct. Because they are, it's right. Very, very uh, hard work to be able to read that old handwriting okay. and make sure you get it transcribed properly. And, and for primarily historians and genealogists, right. we added the Plymouth Colony records, which were from 1620 to, to write about the founding of Plymouth, 1685, yeah. Plymouth, Plymouth County. Yeah. And those are indexed too, to search those. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of interest in the Plymouth Colony records th this past year was the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower uh, in December, as far as Plymouth is concerned. Um, and we're working on a project that'll highlight some of those colony records. You want to talk a little bit sure, sure. about that? You've been very involved in that. Yeah, we've partnered with Plymouth 400. Right. And uh, we have been, um, t we've taken our uh, historic records 
and we have created exhibits of, the, of certain records, for example, for the right to trial by jury, the first deed, um, the first murder case, um, pro right, the first right of pro private property, um, indentured servants, Miles mm -hmm. Standish's will. We have a, probably 25 of them or so, and we, it, we added them to an exhibit with some photographs um, and of the, of the actual records and perhaps some of the characters that were involved and uh, um, added our own little story to it so that it does tell a story of what life was like back in, in Plymouth Colony. And uh, we have, we hopefully will be finishing our final presentation, which will be Congressman Bill Keating. We'll, we'll do the close on the project. It'll all be put together and we'll have a, it available on our website and on the Plymouth 400 website so that folks can uh, watch the, the, uh, the digital presentation of the Plymouth Colony records. So um, I'm getting a signal here. Do you want to share your contact information for any um, historians out there? Oh, sure. Or people that want to sign up for electronic recording? I'm Tim White. I am the Assistant Register of Deeds. Uh, the best number to reach me is 508-830-9292. And one of the things I want to close this segment with, we're constantly trying to upgrade our resources available over the internet. We're working currently on a series of commissioner plans, um, and um, we will be doing things like harbor plans going forward in other smaller projects is to take all of our resources and make sure they're available um, online over the internet. That's the, and that's the general idea, to keep it moving and keep adding things to it to right. give more resources right. to the public. All right, well, thank you. I want to thank Tim White for the great job he did in talking about where we've been through the COVID crisis and uh, the many uh, positive developments we've had by adding more and more to our offsite search. So the holidays in February the 2nd was Groundhog Day. Unfortunately, um, the appearance of the sun showed we had six more weeks of winter. We've been feeling that since the 2nd. Super Bowl Sunday is past us, and Tom Brady pulled it off again. Um, most of us were watching that. The 14th, which just went by, uh, was Valentine's Day, the 15th, was President's Day. Today, the taping of this show is two great holidays. It is Fat Tuesday, otherwise known as Mardi Gras. Uh, Mardi Gras um, is the French version of saying Fat Tuesday. Um, it's a little different this year. In New Orleans, you might have noticed there was no parade, but they decorated the houses on the route uh, to show off some of their great history. And also, today, the 16th, is Lithuanian Independence Day. Um, 17th tomorrow is Ash Wednesday. And let's go to our images for our notable records. The first image related to the Valentine's Day holiday is Minot's Ledge Light. It's a lighthouse known as Lover's Light. Minot's Ledge Light was constructed in 1860, one mile offshore of the town of Situate. Um, after the first lighthouse washed away in a storm, they built another one. Um, there were many shipwrecks off the coast before they built that lighthouse. Um, in the United States, um, Coast Guard um, saved a lot of people out there. But on May 1st, 1894, a new flashing lantern found um, the numerical count the same as the words, I love you, hence the name Lover's Light. The light is built on Minus Ledge, a rocky outcropping, about 0.1 acres, part of the Cohasset Rocks Reef. It's 114 feet tall and is uh, was sold by the United States government in 2014. Next notable record you're going to see also relates to this month's holiday, a very famous 
Lithuanian from Brockton, Fred Bakutis. Fred Bakutis grew up in what was the Lithuanian village of Brockton. So Fred Bakutis graduated from Brockton High, attended the United States Naval Academy, and he had a distinguishing career as a highly decorated Navy fighter pilot in World War II, and then he was commander of naval forces at both the North and South Poles. And he led a naval task force that recovered the Apollo 10 astronauts. While he was in the Antarctica, uh, Fred Bakutis discovered a new territory, named it Brockton, USA, in honor of his hometown. And it's still something you can pull up online today. Also, in honor of Black History Month, um, many people know the story of the Liberty Tree. The Liberty Tree um, is on Frederick Douglass Way, right off of downtown Brockton. It was the site of the Underground Railroad. It was property owned by Edward Bennett and was used as a stop for slaves escaping to Canada, um, try to avoid the slave catchers, kidnappers, and bounty hunters. They hid in a barn that Edward Bennett had on his property. Later, conductors risked their life trying to get slaves north to safety. The Liberty Tree for many centuries was an old sycamore tree on his property. It was used as a signpost for freedom. And um, although the tree later had to be taken down, there's a display there in a new tree growing on the site. A plaque was donated by the Brockton High Class of 1959 to show the site. Certainly worth seeing. Um, and also, we always try to talk about one of our colonial records. Again, the Plymouth Colony records that began in 1620 tell the story about a lot of America. Uh, within the colony records, there are many stories of indentured servants. A lot of people couldn't afford to come over from England to what became America, so they uh, signed on as indentured servants, and they would get their board, their housing, and their food um, given to them for their work um, as an indentured servant. Many of the terms uh, went from uh, seven to 40 years to 11 years. One of the stories is of Thomas Bird, a uh, servant to James Cudworth, who ran away um, from his service, and he had to be whipped and, and taken in uh, and caught in Bonstable. Another story was James, John Winslow, who sold off an indentured servant for 12 pounds to another person to serve out his year. Person bought him, was going to have to provide his uh, food and drink and for the work he did. Well, as we mentioned in the last segment, we're coming out with a video show, a virtual show of the colony record soon, um, hopefully by spring. So I want to thank Lorna Green Baker and Christine Richards from our office for helping put this show together. Emma Redden from Brock and Cable Access worked with me on the production today. And I want to thank the many local access providers throughout Plymouth County who shared this information when I send them a CD of the show to people in their community. For most people, their home is their most valuable, valuable asset. So happy um, Lithuanian Independence Day. Have a great Fat Tuesday, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.